Hey everybody, Joe here. Thanks for tuning in again. I've gotten really far. I'm not quite finished with this flowing water scene and this big butterfly, but it, it's all but just a little bit of touch up now. Thanks to Skipmoo for bringing this up because it's something that I'd never done before. My first step in, in this picture, my strategy was decide where the water's flowing by putting the rocks in. So I sketched it out. When I say sketch, I just mean drawing it with watered down paint. I decided where those rocks would be so that I could put the ripples coming across them appropriately. And for me, that's real important because I like to take colors like this turquoise and purple, something that I chose because it doesn't seem natural. By using these rules of nature and of light and shadow that I've observed, I can make it believable because after all, if I did see a scene that had purple rocks and water and it was real, it would look real once I saw it. I would say, wow, I've never seen that before, but there it is. And so in my mind, anything should be able to be made believable. And so I, I, I was thinking, well, it'd be cool if I took these kind of unnatural colors and tried to make a believable scene out of it. So the next step was just a basic gradient of water flowing over the rock. So the way I do that is, you know, water, you see more reflection as you look across the surface and less reflection as you look straight through it at 90 degrees. I know I've said that a million times, but it really is the basics of painting water. If you really want to know a lot about painting water texture and waves and ripples, I, I do want to recommend that you get my How to Paint Waves series uh, at my site, learn.muraljoe.com, where I sell those because I go to great length to explain things in much further detail than the 10 minute videos that I post on YouTube. I imagine everything as having a pixel size. So if you lower the resolution on this video and, and my face becomes real pixelated and blurry, it still looks like a video of a real guy talking. It just looks blurry and obscured. I choose what the detail level is going to be and I choose my brush size according to that. And then I just start making my background colors with that brush and I like to use that longest corner and, and you can see how I hold my brush. I start blending those colors together but what those colors are is, is just so important. In a background scene there's only a tiny difference between uh, even opposite colors because they're so far away and so buried in maybe a blue atmosphere color. You add atmosphere to distant things so that it looks like a landscape, well, there's not much contrast between them, so little changes matter a lot. And so I always try to really dial in that color. You know, one shade of green is a little bit too red, so I add more blue. And then if it's a little too blue, I add more green. You know, I, I really try to dial it in. I can paint some big leaves that are green in the foreground, and then my just random texture with my brush. I do that in, in almost every mural. My backgrounds are just a matter of putting the colors on with the brush. I don't even think about what details I'm painting. I, you know, I just go quickly and, I, and I'm just putting dabs everywhere and I, you know, one, two, three, four, five, so I've got strokes on it and then I just look for the spaces in between those and I get rid of the edges. And it's real systematic when I do those backgrounds and I'm just thinking this is a background so it needs blue, it needs white, it needs green. And then I'm just like a machine putting those brush strokes on and then putting brush strokes between the brush strokes and I, I'm not even looking at what object I'm painting until I really get that color on there and if something stands out to me I'll start to put it in because I realized some time ago that it, it's not the details that make that background look good it's, it's having the color really dialed in. So whenever you have soft edges in the background and hard edges in the foreground that really helps with depth too. You know, so if you obscure all the detail in a background and in photography, that's that's what a shallow depth of field does on a lens too is it blurs out that background. I talk in those uh, about how you can actually map out the wave patterns and draw reflection appropriately if you want to get that detailed. A lot of this painting I actually just kind of used an impressionistic approach with the brush just going quickly and crisscrossing it and, and then feathering it out to make it blend together, settling for a, a little bit of a looser style because it's flowing water, it's in motion and a lot of times when you snap a picture of a scene like that it, it can be real blurry and that, that can add motion to it. You know when you have airspace underwater 
that's very reflective. It's like a bubble, and bubbles are more reflective. Uh, that is a bubble that's in water. So I'm not talking about a big soap bubble floating around in the air. When you look at that tube of air inside of a big wave, you know, like surfers like to go in that tube. And, well, when that curls over and you see the airspace under it, that airspace reflects light like a mirror. And when you're underwater looking up, that surface is very reflective, more so than the surface of water when you're in the air. So that's valuable because when you want it to look like water shooting out over rocks, you use uh, your, your brightest reflection color on that angle where it's shooting out and then down it, and then I made it get darker as it starts going down. And so that's how I make it look like that water is spouting off of those rocks. The ripple patterns, they're not as much sideways like this, that because the water's moving, they're all getting stretched in the direction of the water flow. And so on this side of the painting, I, I tilt them down like this so that the perspective looks like it's coming more toward you. And a little bit goes a long way. Over here, I tilted them down like this a little bit. Otherwise, I did them really similarly to any other ripples. But then when I get to where they're coming around a rock, I try to very subtly follow that direction and where it's on a curve, you know, it's curving around a rock like this. I don't use long curved shapes to do the long, you know, your, your instinct would be to use long lines of reflection. But because those lines are coming so much toward you, you really shouldn't see a continuous line of reflection along that. So I actually used uh, very short wave patterns where the water was bending a lot like this. And then in some areas, I, I really kept it real simple and did hardly any at all. I love butterflies. I mean, I just love them. When I was a kid, I studied, I had my little Autobahn Society book and I could name, you know, 50, 60, but I don't know, a lot of butterflies by name. And I would go out in the field and, and I'd say, oh, that is the Eastern black swallowtail and you can tell by these markings and that is a oh that's a, a zebra swallowtail and those are very rare we hardly ever see those and I was just very excited at all those I believe that what is happening when you see color combinations that are pleasing is that every color serves a different role in the scheme and they don't interfere with each other's role okay so you have a light that is not dark or saturated. You have a saturated that is not light or dark, and you have a dark that is not saturated or light. <laughs> right? Is that confusing enough? So if you put three colors together like that, it tends to be a very good looking combination. So when I was doing this butterfly, that's what happens when you have sunlight shining on an object. The saturated color is the medium tone shining through the middle of the grape in the sun. The dark color is the shadow, the light color is the reflection bouncing off that's never saturated. Those three colors always happen like that and they give you all of the three-dimensional details of an object you're looking at. So maybe that's why it tends to look nice. I don't know. But it seems to be a working theory that I was pretty excited about on this butterfly. When I posted this painting a couple weeks ago and I had just started it, I was working on the reflection of these purple cliffs in that greenish water. I was making it with a black and white mix and I added a little bit of blue. It, it still was too brown. I still didn't get it. So, you know, I run into this uh, still all the time. You know, I, I never go through a whole job and nail everything. I always come back and say, oh, I should have known that this should have been a little different. Those opposite colors, the violet and that turquoise make a very grayish blue. So I adjusted that again and it does look a lot better with that color, more like a natural reflection of those objects. Let's hit a few comments from previous videos. Balisi says, do you have any tips on how to make more realistic landscape paintings? So, and Joyce says she's, she's doing watercolor, so very different medium, but definitely the same principles apply. And my, my biggest tip is, just like I said earlier, the importance of small differences in, in color and keeping the background really uh, atmospheric. Like, it's not necessarily lighter, it's more the color of your sky, of your atmosphere. And that atmospheric haze, as a lot of artists call it, is really important in a landscape. And then understanding, just like I've explained on previous videos, what opposite colors do when they mix. Because with landscapes, you have an, an orange sun a lot of the time, an orange light source shining 
uh, on one part of an object, but this blue sky shining on the other side. And it's important to know uh, so that you can make that violet blue shadow and, and that nice bright orange light. Understanding the light and the colors that, that uh, result when you combine other colors is vital to doing landscapes. And that by itself, that understanding of color and the understanding of distant things being more the color of the atmosphere and, and having your perspective, uh, that halves and doubles rule that I've explained before. Sometimes you forget when you don't have things on a triangle like a road going off into the distance. When things are just scattered, you can forget to make the size appropriate. But the thing about that triangle of, of a road, you know, disappearing, I'll do it this way, you know, this, you know, that road that keeps coming in. <laughs> if you go halfway up that triangle, it's half the size. Well, every time you go halfway to the horizon in a landscape, you are at roughly twice the distance and an object would then be half of its original size that you had it in the foreground. Good rule to remember, every time you cut the distance to the horizon in half, the size is cut in half and the distance is double. I call that the uh, rule of halves and doubles. Roberta v Volp, I, I might have written that wrong. Are you using photographs or just creating from your fantasy? For me, it's very hard without a picture to understand the shadows. It can be hard, it can be really intimidating, but yes, I, this is all just from my imagination, but I've uh, gone to great lengths to study the patterns of nature. I think that I have a fundamental belief that allows me to put tons of my energy into learning these things. And, and that, that fundamental belief is that nothing is complicated, it's just complex. And the system that makes it what it is, is waiting to be discovered. It's there to be discovered, it's just waiting. So when I look at rippling swimming pool water with all the squiggles of light and colors just going everywhere, you know, I'm, I'm trying to read it like a book, like, like a book that I know the language and I know the words too, whereas someone else might be looking at it and saying, oh, that's, that's um, chaos. It's chaotic. There's not, there's not a recognizable system to that. It's just water going every which way all at the same time. There's no system. Therefore, no learning takes place because there's a belief there that there isn't something to be learned. It's chaos and without order. But I believe that everything is just beautifully organized in nature. And I take that approach to everything I see. So when I look at a rock, I, I look at the way the edges are cut on that rock and I imagine what might cause that and I look at how the light hits those and I find the patterns even in the most random looking things what are the patterns what are the kinds of shapes how can I categorize them and recreate my world from that knowledge and I've just spent a lot of years looking at things from that mindset so that you know when I'm imagining something I can put it into the picture in a believable way but I'm still in the dark about tons of things. I mean, I'm not claiming to have it understood. That's just the strategy that I use. Diana Torres uh, says, if the sky is orange, what color does the water have to be? So great question. I've covered it before. It's just as simple as that color triangle combination. You just take the two colors that your watercolor, your reflection color, combine them. What is the result? It's predictable and it's easy to understand once you're familiar with that system. Uh, I want to let you guys know that there are some workshops coming up. I'm finally uh, organizing some workshops. So here in Flagstaff, August 16th, 17th, 18th, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's going to be all about painting water and I'll be working together with everybody to paint an actual scene that, that you can take home during, uh, during the course of this workshop. And that will be following this show that I've done. So I've never done an art show before. I've never shown my pictures in any gallery or any, any uh, place at all. I've never shown my work because it's never been on canvases. It's always been on people's walls and bedrooms, living rooms. And so now I'm doing a show uh, with, with uh, I've been able to get like 16 paintings done. And so that's going to be in this gallery. And that will be showing August 5th here in Flagstaff, Arizona. So if you can make it, we have this uh, first Friday art walk that uh, my paintings will be showing at. So I'm very excited about that. And hopefully some of you can make it to see that show. 
I really appreciate you watching the video and I'll be looking forward to next week.